welcome back to computer science theory. This is comms W3261. And this is lecture nine, part one. Um, lecture nine being on recognizing, deciding, and enumerating. All the things that Turing machines can do. Uh, the teaser for today is a question about a language. And the question is, is the language of palindromes, that is strings that are the same forwards and backwards over the alphabet, over the alphabet, zero, one, Turing recognizable. And for this teaser, I want you to think about not a formal description of a Turing machine that could recognize this language, but um, think about an informal description, an implementation level description, or even a high level description. You remember our Turing machines look like state controls with heads attached, reading and writing from tapes, and shuttling back and forth. That's what they can do. So how might you go about instructing a Turing machine to recognize this language? So I'll let you pause the video now and think about it for a second, and then I'll come back and explain how I think about this. So this language of palindromes is L such that um, a string is a string in a traversal or W0, W reversed, or W1, W reversed. Those two cases capture the odd palindromes where W is any string in zero, one star, any string over the binary alphabet. And here's an implementation level. Description of a Turing machine M1 for L. So if you remember an implementation level description, that's a description where we don't specify the specifics of the states or the specifics of the transition function, but we do talk about how the head moves around and how we manage memory on the tape. So it's just a little bit less formal than the complete formal specification of the Turing machine as a seven tuple. So M1 looks like the following. On an input, S, we um, accept if the tape contains zero or one symbols. And to do this, we can just shuttle back and forth to read string length. So if our tape has just one symbol, or if it has no symbols, then it's clearly a palindrome. That'll be our kind of preliminary check, our step zero. And then we'll do the following repeatedly. We will remember the leftmost symbol um, and we can remember the leftmost symbol just by going to a state that corresponds to, we just saw a zero or we just saw a one and erase it. Traverse the tape and check if the rightmost symbol mm, 
matches the leftmost symbol. And then if yes, if they do match, erase the rightmost, go back to the leftmost uncrossed symbol. and repeat from step zero. If no, reject. So this is a complete implementation level description of a certain Turing machine that I claim will accept the palindromes. To see how it might work, we can imagine I put in the palindrome 0110110. And if we follow these instructions, we would do as follows. First, we would check and see if uh, the input string contains zero or one symbols. It doesn't, so we ignore that. And now we shuttle back and forth. First, we erase the leftmost symbol. We remember that it's a zero. We go all the way to the right and erase the rightmost symbol. Now we go back. We still don't have zero symbols, so we erase this one, and this one, this one, and this one, and then finally we have a single symbol left, so we accept. If we tried a non-palindrome, we would start by erasing alternate symbols until finally we reached one that did not match its corresponding symbol, and in this case, we'd reject. So that's an implementation level description of a Turing machine. We'll see at least two more of those today at the beginning of this lecture as examples. So we get more and more uncomfortable, more and more comfortable with writing these implementation level descriptions of Turing machines formally and completely. Announcements for the day. Uh, homework number five is due on August 2nd, that is next Monday at 11 59 p.m. Eastern time and see Ed for information about the final. Uh, so there's a pin post there and you can ask any clarifying questions on that post. So the very high level description of what the final will look like, it'll be available on Gradescope, sort of like a homework from 12.01 a.m. on Wednesday, August 10th through 11.59 p.m. on Thursday, August 11th, both times Eastern time. So there's 48 hours in total during which you can download it and turn it in. Um, during those 48 hours, you can select any contiguous 12 hours to take the test. So download it at the beginning of the 12 hours, work on it for those 12 hours, and then turn it in at the end. So those 12 hours should be more than enough time for you to actually finish the test. So it should not take you more than, I don't know, four or five hours tops. Um, there'll be five or six questions, uh, hopefully about the level as one of the later homework problems. And the goal will be that you can read through the test, think about it for a little bit, sketch some solutions, then you know take a break, eat lunch, come back, write up the test answers. So the only other, I think, substantial thing that I want to note is on the final exam, it will be open book and open note, but it is not open internet, including reference sources. You can't use Wikipedia or anything like that for this test. So full details are on that ed post. They're also on CourseWorks, so you can check that out. Readings for today. This lecture corresponds to SIPSER section 3.1. That's the introduction of Turing machines. SIPSER 3.2 for variations on Turing machines, including multi-tape Turing machines. Yes, we're going to go there. Uh, Non-deterministic Turing, Turing machines and enumerators. All things we'll see today. Finally, SIPSER section 3.3 is 
roughly covers what we'll talk about in the from Turing machines to algorithms section of this lecture. So we're covering most of chapter three today. Um, that way, uh, next week, we can start talking about specific languages that are decidable, recognizable, non-recognizable, and um, talk about time and space complexity classes, hopefully, if we have time. We're really getting down to it. We're on the third to last lecture. So hopefully, we start to have some fun. I think we will. This is one of my favorite lectures of the whole course. This last part we'll do today. So. Today, we'll do basically the three sections above. We'll do a quick review of Turing machines. We'll talk about variant Turing machines. And we'll talk about uh, going from Turing machines to more general notions of algorithms and how we can do this while maintaining accuracy. In particular, it's going to turn out that Turing machines can do almost anything. So we'll be able to build up a vocabulary of complicated operations that they can do and talk about them at a high level. Much like how if you were programming a computer from scratch, you might start with just a processor and a memory and a few machine code instructions. On top of them, you would build a machine code language. On top of that, you would build a low-level systems language like C. And on top of that, you would build high-level fun languages like JavaScript and Python, or even programs that make it very easy to do very complicated things in a human readable form. That's sort of analogous to the process we'll do in section three. All right. So let's do some Turing machine examples at implementation level. So today, for the most part, we're going to be thinking about high level stuff. So suppose we have the goal of deciding the language C equals A to the I, B to the J, C to the K, such that IJ equals K, and I, J, K are greater than or equal to one. This is a, a cool language. It's unlike languages we've seen before because it really sort of captures the concept of multiplication. We want the number of A's and the number of B's multiplied together to equal the number of C's. So you can think of this just as an encoding of a generalized multiplication problem. And as our Turing machine that decides C as being a Turing machine that uh, gives us the answer to a multiplication problem. So we're already dealing with powerful stuff. Recall that deciding means yes, if in a language and no otherwise. I wrote yes and no, that's equivalent to accept and reject. Whereas recognizing means yes, if in the language, may loop or reject otherwise. So a recognizer, uh, has to recognize all and only the strings in the language, but if the string is not in the language, it may run for an arbitrarily long time or loop forever instead of directly rejecting. All right. So how are we going to do this multiplication? Well, we've already seen Turing machines that shuttle back and forth to count to make sure things are equal. Uh, for this question, we're going to see how we might implement the implementation level, a sort of nested loop, 
in particular, we're going to try to um, read off J C's for every A. In other words, we'll have B times A C's crossed off if everything goes well. So here's what our, our machine will look like. We'll take in an input string W. And the first thing we'll do will be scan left to right to ensure we have a string matching A plus B plus C plus. So what this check is going to do is just make sure we have a string that matches the format we want. That is, it's got only A's, B's, and C's, some substring of A's with at least one A, some substring of B's of at least one B, and some substring of C's of at least one C. And they're in that order. Clearly, we're going to reject if we don't have a string in that format. Next, we will return to the leftmost square. And then we'll do the following. Cross off the first A. Then shuttle back and forth between B's and C's. Crossing off one C for each B. So we're going back and forth, uh, sort of like we did in the palindrome question, cross off a B, cross off a C, cross off a B, cross off a C. If all goes well, we'll cross off a bunch of C's and all of the B's. Project, if we run out of C's, Now, if we don't run out of C's, we will restore, that is, uncross all the B's and return to step two. So in other words, we're going to cross off the same number of B's and C's, then we'll uncross all the B's, go back to step two, which takes us back to the left-hand square cross off another A and do it again, which means we're going to cross off, um, if there are J Bs, we're going to cross off J Cs I many times. In other words, we'll cross off I J Cs. Once all A's are crossed, except if no Cs remain uncrossed. So what this could look like on the string A, 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 B, B, C, 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 C. This is an except string because there are three A's and two B's. Three times two is six, and there are six C's. We'd start by crossing out an A, going to the right, crossing out a B, crossing out a C, crossing out a B, crossing out a C. Um, at this point, we've crossed out all the Bs, um, but we still have some Cs left. So we'd uncross the Bs, and then we'd have a string that looks like this. We go back to the left, cross off an A, shuttle back and forth, two Bs, two Cs, and then the last step is going to cross off all the A's, the last two B's, and all six C's at the same time. So we've sort of implemented a nested loop in our Turing machine 
using this crossing trick. So that was multiplication on TMs. And if you want to get even more clever, you can try to um, write down a Turing machine that will multiply two numbers written out as decimals. It's a lot more complicated. You got to carry, you got to count, you got to be creative with the way you mark things, but it is doable. I'll tell you that. Uh, another example. Here's a Turing machine that solves the problem of element distinctness. So we had a Turing machine that can multiply. Now we're going to show a Turing machine that tests if all elements are distinct. So the goal for this Turing machine will be to decide the language E equals pound x1, pound x2, pound x3, dot, 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 the pound xl, such that each xi is a string over the binary alphabet, and xi does not equal xj, or i does not equal to j. So in other words, we're going to have a lot of binary strings separated by pound signs. And we're going to want to accept if and only if all the binary strings are different. So the idea here will also be sort of a looping structure. We'll compare x1 with all the xi's, i greater than 1, reject if we find a match. Then compare x2 with all xi, i greater than 2, and so on. So we'll compare x1 with x2, x3, x4, blah, 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 then x2 with x3, x4, x5, x3 with x4, x5, x6, until we have run out of pairwise comparisons to make. If at any point we'll find a, we find a match, we'll reject. If at any point um, we have finished the comparisons, then finally we'll accept. So here is an example, implementation level example of a Turing machine that solves this problem. And it will use a cool marking trick. I'll explain how you might mark tape squares to uh, solve a question like this. So machine M4 will work as follows. On an input string W, um, one, check to make sure the string is in the right format. Reject if not. That is, um, it better be pound signs separating binary strings. Uh, except if there is less than two inputs in the right format. So we do a second check. Again, scanning from left to right. And if we only see pound sign and then a single binary string, well, of course, we accept. We don't have anything to compare it to. Uh, now we're left with the case that's interesting, which is the case where we have uh, at least two inputs in the right format. We need to come up with a procedure for checking every input against every other input to make sure it's unique. So we'll say otherwise, if neither of these two first checks hold, mark the first two pound signs 
like this. So we'll scan from left to right, and the first two times we see a pound sign, we'll put a dot over it. And you might be wondering, well, wait, why is it why is it legal to mark a pound sign? That seems like it's beyond the behavior for our Turing machine. So this is okay because we can have both a pound sign and a pound sign with a mark over it in our tape alphabet. And generally, we can have any finite number of marks, right? Uh, any way you might want to mark an input symbol, well, you can just add two symbols to your tape alphabet, one unmarked and one marked. So really, when I say mark a pound sign, that's shorthand for erase a pound sign and replace it with a pound sign with a mark over it doesn't stop our Turing machine from treating it the same way. Next, scan the two strings to the right of the marked pound signs and reject if they match. So by scan, I just mean shuttle back and forth. So X1 will be some ones and zeros, X2 will be some ones and zeros, and we'll have a turning machine program that'll go from X1 to the first symbol of X2, back to the second symbol of X1, the second symbol of X2, and it will um, reject only if they match in all of their symbols. So assuming they don't mark, assuming they don't match, how do we update our markings? Well, first, if possible, move the right mark to the right and repeat um, step three. Sorry, step four. So in this particular example, if it's possible to move the right marking to the right, we'll do so. We would go from something that looks like a marked pound sign x1, marked pound sign x2, pound sign, to marked pound sign x1, unmarked pound sign x2, and then a marked pound sign for x3 and some more stuff. So. What that'll mean is that we're moving the right dot on down the line, and effectively, we're telling our machine to compare x1 with x2, then with x3, then with x4. And if this is not possible, right mark is on the last pound sign. Move the left, mark forward, and the right mark back to the next pound sign after the left mark. So in other words, if we have the left mark over here, a bunch of stuff, and then the right mark at the end of our string. Well, in that case, we cannot move the right mark to the right. So we will then move the left mark to the right, move the right mark back to match it. So it's next to it, and we'll start the procedure over again. Hopefully you can see that we're gradually stepping to the light to the right, and this will ensure that we end up accepting all or testing all pairs of strings eventually. Finally, if we've marked the last two pound signs, accept. 
So in this particular case, if we see our two marks around the last two pound signs on the far right, that means we have checked every single pair of inputs. Uh, we've said we've rejected if any pair of them were the same, if any pair matched. So none of them must have matched. And in this case, we can finally reject. So we have this program for machine N4, this mark mover. And now we have two tactics, mark moving, looping, which we can use formally and informally. So now we know how to nest two loops. We know how to multiply. Uh, we know how to check string matching and distinctness and hopefully it's clear not only that Turing machines have a lot more power than any automaton we've seen before but also that our power is going to grow very quickly so we talked earlier about proving languages regular or context-free using closure properties we said, wow, closure properties are great. We can take any two languages that we know are regular and prove that their union is regular and their concatenation is regular. Well, this is much, much more powerful even than that. Because now we can say, well, if we've got any two languages, we can, you know, we can take their inputs and multiply them using Turing machines. We can nest them inside each other as subroutines. Um, we can check string matching and distinctness. We can pattern match. And this sort of intuition is what's going to move us up the chain from formal definitions that we did last time to implementation level definitions, which we'll do this time. And finally, high level definitions, which we'll get to at the end of the day today, where we're able to finally just sit back and say, our Turing machines can do anything we can specify well. And all we have to do to make them run generic algorithms is write down the algorithm. And we can assume somewhere out there is a TM that'll do precisely what we want. So, yeah, hopefully you're as excited about this as I am. I kind of doubt it, but if you do happen to be, that could be a good sign that doing more research and classes in this could be for you. Uh, at any rate, that is all for this segment of the lecture, the first segment of, I think, three. When we come back, we will discuss variants on Turing machines. In particular, we'll give Turing machines new superpowers and we'll show that they don't actually increase the power of Turing machines at all, which means we can assume the superpowers without loss of generality if it helps us out, further expanding what our TMs can do. Um, so I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.